Hi, everyone. Uh, this lecture, we will be talking about a little bit more about the influence of groups. Uh, we'll be talking about social influence, teamwork, bureaucracy, and qualities of leadership. Uh, if you remember him from the earlier parts in the course, this is a section where uh, Max Weber is incredibly influential. So social influence, also known as peer pressure, is the influence of one's fellow group members on the individual attitudes and behaviors of the people in that group. Generally, uh, people conform to group norms because we want to gain acceptance and approval also known as positive sanctions. And we want to avoid rejection or disapproval or negative sanctions. So the reason we list, we go along with our friends is they want us to like us and we don't want them to, you know, dislike us or make fun of us. Maybe at a job, the reason why we go along is we want to keep getting paid or we don't want to get fired. Now, there are three levels of conformity that any group can um, use. These go compliance, identification, internalization. So compliance is the mildest form of conformity in which actions are attained to gain reward or avoid punishment. So let's say, for example, you're working at a pizza shop you don't have much of a connection to the job whatsoever, but you do listen to the rules because you don't want your boss to yell at you and you don't want to get fired and you want to keep getting paid. That is the compliance level. Now let's say you work for that pizza shop a few more years and you establish a relationship with the people working there. Maybe you're actually friends with your boss. You think it's a pretty good place to work. So at the identification level, then you follow the rules because of your relationship with your boss or the company. Um, there might be some silly rules you think are just still kind of silly, but you follow them because you you like the company. And then internalization. This is the strongest type of conformity. Uh, in the internalization phase, an individual adopts the beliefs or actions of the group and makes the beliefs or actions their own. So within internalization, let's say you work at that pizza company and you know the reason that you cook a pizza for so long is to keep it from burning, or you know that the reason they have that rule about the um, cash register is to keep people from stealing it, you know the rules are good rules and that's why you follow those rules and you believe they're good rules. That's the internalization level. So compliance, you're doing it to keep getting paid. Identification, you're doing it because you like the people that work there or you like the place. Internalization, you follow the rules because you know they're good rules and they're rules you would make. Now let's talk about teamwork. Now a group can always almost always outperform an individual, but that group rarely performs as well as it could in theory. Uh, this is caused by a phenomenon known as social loafing. So as a group's size increases, social loafing tends to increase. Uh, some reasons for that is that people may perceive that the job is getting done. Maybe as more people add, there are more people, things to distract them. Uh, or it could be that some people are legitimately lazy, but uh, it's probably more like people are perceiving the job is getting done. Now, group leaders can increase efficiency by recognizing individual effort. They can do that. So you can say, good work, Jim. You're doing a good job here at the pizza place, and then Jim feels like he's doing a good job, and his efficiency will go up correspondingly. But you can also use social identity. Uh, so if you can cause the people to identify as a member of the group, then efficiency can increase. Uh, we see this with things like high school sports teams. So if you are a member of one of the schools I teach for are the Columbus State Cougars, if you see yourself as a member of the Cougars and you really identify as that in that group, then you 
um, you know, you'll have social identity, you don't want to leave your team members down, etc., and that will make you more efficient. New set of concepts, bureaucracy. Weber pioneered sociological research on bureaucracies, and we will define bureaucracy as a type of secondary group that is designed to perform tasks efficiently. That might sound like a misnomer. Often when we think about bureaucracies, we think about inefficient organizations, but the reality is bureaucracies are designed to be efficient. Now, when they malfunction, they can become very inefficient. And that's something that interested Weber. According to Weber, all bureaucracies have six common traits. These six traits are laid out on this slide and the next slide. Uh, specialization, first trait. Jobs are highly specific. I at the university, my job is to lecture, is to program what's happening on learn, but only to a certain degree. I can't do anything I want to on learn. I have to follow certain ramifications. But I have a very specific job. I could not do the job of the computer programmer. I could not do the job of the lady working in the cafeteria because I don't know how to do that job. Specific jobs. Technical competence. I possess this job because I possess an advanced degree. Not only do I possess an advanced degree, I possess an advanced degree in sociology. I couldn't be an anthropology professor. I couldn't be a physics professor because I don't have those degrees. Hierarchy. Everyone in the bureaucracy is either subordinate to or over everyone else. This serves the purpose of giving everyone a boss and everyone knows who to hold themselves accountable to. And this allows the people at the top to be able to disseminate orders efficiently. Rules and regulations. There are rules for everything. So uh, we take care of this. We know how to do what happens when Lobo Web goes down. We know what to do in a given situation. And hypothetically, we have it all figured out. Impersonality. We don't do favors for friends or relatives, that is to keep, uh, you know, keep everything equal, keep everything fair, right? And formal written communication, we um, always have a paper trail or in the modern era, an electronic trail, an email trail to figure out when things go wrong, whose fault it is, and how we can fix a problem. Now, each of these six, let me go back for a second, can go very wrong to make the bureaucracy inefficient. So specialization, let's say you overly specialize, the lady at the cash register doesn't, she knows how to run the cash register, but like she doesn't know how to turn it on, that could be someone else's job, that would make things inefficient. Technical competence, if you are hiring people based solely on degree, but maybe let's say uh, someone, you hire a teacher because they have a PhD, but they're a lousy teacher, then that isn't good. Hierarchy, if there's too much hierarchy, if it's too complex, then you're responding to multiple bosses. A lot of people like to talk about the movie Office Space in this way. That's an example. Rules and regulations. Let's say people become too dependent on the rules. Let's say um, people don't allow me to do my proper teaching because uh, this form hasn't been filled out in triplicate or whatever. Impersonality. Uh, let's say someone comes down with cancer, and because that person comes down with cancer, uh, they, they need a little bit more help, but we can't grant it to them. That's an example of inefficiency. And formal written communication. Let's say seven emails need to be sent out to do any given thing. That can cause things to be inefficient as well. This can be a confusing set of concepts, but the key to it is there are six rules to bureaucracy. If you have those six things, you are a bureaucracy, and each of those th six things can backfire as well. If you have any questions on that, either consult the book or ask me. Um, I do strongly uh, suggest against um, consulting the internet and consulting anything other than your book for this because uh, certain fields such as public relations or uh, human HR, 
they have different spins on Weber's work than could get confusing. Bureaucracies, Weber also stated, are impersonal but efficient, and they provide many of the necessities in modern life. Uh, he argues that the reason why we have bureaucracies is it's the only way to do things on such a mass scale that we see in the industrial and post-industrial world. Uh, later on, George Ritzer in the 1990s coined this term McDonaldization, so this is long after Weber. Uh, he used the term to describe the spread of bureaucratic rationalization and the resulting increase in both efficiency and dehumanization. So Ritzer looked at Weber's work and said, yes, this is true. We have bureaucracies. They are making our world more efficient and more dehumanizing, but it's not just the workplace that it's doing it in. It's all aspects of our lives. It's when we go to a restaurant, we expect the food to be the same quality all the time, even if that same quality is McDonald's level quality. Um, and that can be dehumanizing. Uh, the book they're referring to, it's called McDonaldization in Everyday Life. If this idea is really interesting to you, it's a pretty good book. Now let's talk about qualities of leadership. Um, I like to pull essay questions from this, and I believe um, you will have to deal with this in our materials for this week. Uh, so uh, leadership or authority comes from power, and power we will define is the ability to control the actions of others. It includes both coercive power and influential power. Coercive power is power that is backed by the threat of force. So if I hold a gun to you, I can make you do in that moment almost anything I want you to, right? But the weakness of coercive power is that usually when that threat of force is removed, if that gun is removed from the situation, the person you're wielding power, power over almost always stops listening to you immediately, right? Coercive power is only good as far as long as the threat of force is there. Influential power then is in the long term more powerful. So if you can persuade someone to go along with you, if you can persuade something, someone to do something, they'll be more likely to be more loyal and you can cause them to do things better in the long run. Now, one second. These power, do not confuse these with uh, Weber's types of authority or, um, or Weber's uh, types of leadership. We're specifically here, we're talking about authority. There are three types of authority identified by Weber. We have traditional authority, legal rational authority, and charismatic authority. Every authority figure in our society possesses one of these three qualities, and authority may be derived from multiple types. So it is possible to be a traditional and a rational legal authority, or a traditional charismatic, a legal charismatic, etc. Traditional authority is authority that is based in custom, in birthright, or divine right. When we talk about traditional authority, we are talking about things like kings and queens, right? So people from this family have always been in power, therefore uh, they always will be in power. Uh, traditional authority is very much um, mostly a thing of the past, especially on the governmental level. Uh, you still see it to a degree in on community levels. So like this family has always been in charge of the potluck at our church or something like that. Uh, but in general, traditional authority doesn't, it doesn't happen so much anymore. Oh, sorry. Legal rational authority then is based in the law, in rules and procedures. Legal rational authority are those people fo who followed the rules to get their position of power. Uh, elected officials are typically uh, legal rational authority figures. They were elected. Uh, they filled out certain paperwork. They qualified to be in those positions. Similarly, managers in a corporation, they 
uh, fault. They were hired legally. They followed the rules. They got various degrees to move up the ladder. Owners of a business uh, within the rules of how capitalism works in the United States. If you open a business, you are entitled to a certain degree of authority. You can hire and fire people as you wish in general. That is a type of legal, rational authority. Finally, charismatic authority. Charismatic authority is based in the perception of remarkable personal qualities in a leader. Charismatic authority is the least stable type of leadership because it's based on the individual. Many dictatorships, when they first start, many revolutions often have charismatic authority figures. These are people who are capable of stirring up great emotion in people. But if those people are unable to set a base for the government in legal rational authority before they die or are assassinated or whatever, the entire revolution, the entire movement can fall apart because they were relying on charismatic authority. So examples of uh, charismatic authority figures, as I mentioned, are dictators, revolutionaries, and to a degree, elected officials. In the United States, it typically isn't enough to be a bureaucrat, to be someone who knows how to follow the rules to get elected. There have been a lot of people who have run for office who have not gotten office because they weren't likable enough. Uh, so elected officials are also charismatic authority figures. And But do not be confused. Just because you're a charismatic authority figure doesn't mean everyone likes you. Um, there are certainly politicians who are highly divisive that people like, certain people like, what they have to say but other people certainly don't like what they have to say and those people are definitely charismatic authority figures despite the fact everyone doesn't like them now don't confuse these two styles of leadership with weber's types of authority okay these styles of leadership are something else uh we have instrumental leadership and expressive leadership and this can be easily applied to understanding a workplace or a family or again what a, any type of leadership situation. An instrumental leader is a leader that is task oriented or goal oriented. So uh, an instrumental leader, leader is less concerned with people's feelings than getting the job done. Uh, so if you are a boss that just wants to get the job done and you think it's appropriate to yell at somebody to get the job done, uh, so be it, or to fire someone to get the job done, or, you know, whatever congratulate someone to get the job done all you want to know is getting the job done great that's an instrumental leader let me just take the next slide okay an expressive leader is concerned with maintaining emotional and relational harmony with the group and this leads to a more positive work environment the philosophy there being if um everything is basically kept cool in the workplace kept you know, chilling, whatever you want to call it, um, then uh, the workplace will be happier and happy workers make good workers. That's the concept there. That is the philosophy behind expressive leadership. Now, instrumental leaders typically often are tend to be males or more traditionally oriented males. Expressive leaders tend to be females or people who are a little more traditionally feminine. That's certainly not always the case. It's just a general trend in society and how uh, gender norms tend to break down in society. Um, neither expressive leadership or um, instrumental leadership are uh, inherently better. Uh, certainly something like maybe the military or uh, putting out a fire among firefighters. You want an instrumental leader there, right? We won't need to be debating the best way to put out the fire, we need to put out the fire, right? Uh, similarly, in an expressive leadership situation, uh, maybe if you're directing a bunch of artists or you're dealing with um, creative types, uh, those types of people don't generally t like to be yelled at. You want to go with an expressive leader. Uh, table 5.1, just a reminder, uh, these, table, these first tables in the chapter are always 
good study guides. So do this week. In our discussion, uh, I want you to talk about to what extent you think your social networks have changed due to social media. And how do you think your social networks were different from those of your great grandparents due to that impact, right? So we talked about how social networks have always existed, but they probably have changed to a degree. So I want you to reflect on that in your discussion. Uh, this week, we also have our midterm essay. So I want you to write me an essay on the three types of authority on uh, how you would classify the authority of the President of the United States and why. And be sure to show me you understand each of the three types. Uh, important hint, both Barack Obama, Obama, Donald Trump, and all other modern presidents uh, possess the same type or types of authority. Uh, it doesn't really matter on politics. Um, this is just the authority the president overwhelmingly tends to have. Okay, that is it for the week. And if you have any questions on anything, as always, please let me know.